All right. I look forward to this all week long. Let me welcome in Michael Schur to the broadcast. Yay, Michael Schur. Good to be here. Good to be here. Hi. How are you? Uh, well, good. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Merry, happy, merry. Happy almost New Year. Yeah, exactly. How about that? I'm a little scared, I have to say. I mean, at least with 2023, I kind of, everything was set. We have Biden in office. We knew what we were getting. And this whole political climate moving into 2024, I'm I'm nervous for what it's going to bring. Yeah, I mean, election years are always tense for anyone on yeah. either side who doesn't mm -hmm. like or who loves <laughs> what's there. So uh, yeah. it's normal. I wouldn't uh, make uh, too much hay over it. What's not mm -hmm. normal is the way it's playing out and... You know, in, in a lifetime, we only have the elections we remember to use as reference points. And this mm -hmm. one will likely be one that is unlike any of the ones that we can remember. So I don't know if we I've talked to you about Colorado with the state Supreme Court saying no Trump on the ballot. And now the the GOP Republican Party in Colorado appealing that. And now we have Maine, who the secretary of state has said no Trump on the ballot, but I'm staying my decision, she said, until the courts can decide. Um, and so Trump obviously will be appealing that one as well, that they have said the Trump campaign has said that. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I am hopeful that this provides some relief for getting him off of the ballot everywhere. But California says they're not going to do this until some type of court case is uh, resolves the matter. So I guess the question is, and we've never seen anything like this. So, you know, I don't know if there's even an answer. Who gets to decide whether a presidential candidate appears on the ballot or not? And maybe this is the time where we answer that question. Well, I mean, there it, there are many ways that those decisions are made, some by the state party uh, and, uh, you know, some by the Constitution. I think that there are constitutional challenges that happen uh, regularly that are not as high profile in terms of getting people on the ballot. There's the natural born citizen uh, issue. There is the issue of uh, of age um, that, that some people even dispute the the vagaries in the Constitution on that. But this one is going to have to go to the courts. Um, and, and the reason being that the Supreme Court is the ultimate interpreter of the Constitution. And the 14th Amendment is what is uh, holding up here in Maine, at least, and in Colorado, uh, if not in Michigan, if not in Minnesota, if not in Colorado, in California. I shouldn't even say not in California because it hasn't been challenged officially there. And 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 Trump's name will be on the ballot there. Newsom, the governor there, Gavin Newsom, saying or here, saying that um, that he in California we defeat our candidates at the, at the polls, not right. in the courts. Um, but but if there's a court ruling and if there's something that says from the Supreme Court that he is not uh, entitled to be on the ballot because of what he had done in violation of the Fourteenth Amendment, again seriously unlikely that we would see that happen. Um, I, I think that he will end up being on a lot of these ballots. Also, it would help the cause of the people who don't like this to see it happen in what we look at as a red state, right? I mean, we're looking at uh, Maine, which is a blue state, uh, even though Minnesota and Michigan, both blue states went the other way. Uh, Colorado now a blue state is not. And so if you saw this come from a Republican state, that mm -hmm. might help that case at the Supreme Court. But again, I think ultimately when these state Supreme Courts act, that it's going to go eventually to the to the federal court. So you say it's unlikely that the Supreme Court would rule against Donald Trump in this. Is that what I heard? Yeah, I, I do. I, I think that, that that they would probably, I mean, the, the best ruling, if you don't want to see Donald Trump on your ballot, the best ruling would be one that isn't a ruling that says we're not going to, we're going to send this back to the to the state courts. And then it just kind of muddies the water uh, because this it'll he'll be on in some states and not on in other states. And then there'll be a whole move. If, if he is crushing uh, the rest of the way, those uh, delegates won't matter at a convention. But if they do and not being on those ballots ends up mattering, then then these courts and these state courts will will, will prevail. I, I, I just when I say I don't think that the court I think if the court hears it, which I think they will do. And again, I'm not a I'm not a Supreme Court guy. You know, I've covered it. I've been there for rulings, but I don't know the nuts and bolts of it. But if if they look at this and, and they decide to take the case, then I think um, they will probably rule and almost certainly rule in favor of the Trump um, appeal. See, that's so interesting because I've talked to other other people who say 
it's so black and white. It's like the other, other rules you mentioned. It's like you have to be 35. You have to be a citizen. It's, it's so cut and dry that even if you are somebody that looks at the Constitution and you're not looking for nuances, you're just, uh, you know, here's exactly what it says and here's what I'm going to, uh, to a strict constitutionalist, they say, right? Even if you are either way, like there, it's just cut and dry. There's no way you could not find that the 14th Amendment applies here. Well, there's, there's, right, but you would that that presumes that you believe that Donald Trump incited an insurrection, mm -hmm. right? And and that has not been decided in the courts yet. I mean, that is in the court of public opinion, in the court of Congress, in the court mm -hmm. of the divided nation. Yes, but but not officially in the courts. And they the the Supreme Court rules on precedent, and if there isn't precedent. Then, then it becomes very difficult to say, well, this is clearly a violation. But if you're looking at a convicted, a man convicted of inciting insurrection, mm -hmm. uh, and then you're uh, putting it in, in the framework of the 14th Amendment, yeah, then you're having a different kind of conversation. It becomes more black and white. But but what's what's so nebulous here is the fact that he has not yet been convicted of anything. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of convictions, Nikki Haley is coming out. And I mean, I didn't expect anything different from her, but she says that she will pardon Trump as president. So if she is elected, she said yesterday that she would pardon former President Trump because she said it would be in the best interest of the country. Her campaign. Oh, what? It would um, be in, <laughs> I mean, what? Yeah. Uh, I, I just, the mere thought that he could skate again without any consequences, with with such upheaval in America, with uh, trying to steal the vote in a million different ways, with what I consider to be inciting uh, a, an insurrection, and she's going to pardon him, and she thinks that's in the best interest of the country? Uh, mm. Well, there there is precedent for that. Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon, and yeah. it was, you know, in retrospect, I think more people now think it may have been in the best interest of the country, even, even if distasteful. I'm not going to be the arbiter of that, but, mm -hmm. but so, um, while you may not agree with Nikki Haley, it's kind of smart politics because she is going to need, if she is to prevail or if Trump is not to get on the ballot, she's going to need Trump supporters, uh, in her camp. There's right. no way a Republican, if Donald Trump is not standing, uh, or is losing, uh, there's no way a Republican can win without the support of the people that he brings out to the, to the poll. So I, I, I understand why a Republican would say that now, um, mm -hmm. and, and also be able to look at it very differently were they to be elected. But I, I think that, you know, in a, in a week where you could say she did something really, really stupid politically, um, although I'm not even sure if that's true, um, that she did something that was probably sound for her campaign. Uh, mm -hmm. But if not, for you know, if, if people disagree that it's good for the country. <laughs> so let's talk about that uh, moment of stupidity, which I think you're you were right the first time. She is asked, and I don't, again, I don't know exactly why she's asked this question, unless somebody wanted to kind of gotcha her. They said, what was the cause of the Civil War? And she refused to say, refuses to say that slavery, the word slavery, uh, and I don't know how you talk about the Civil War and don't use the word slavery was the cause, but she pulled it off uh, or not quite because she's faced a lot of backlash. And now I'm reading this report on Politico that even Republicans are saying, no, she should have communicated better in that moment. Uh, she ch chose to use a tired old political stump tactic by tossing this, the question back to the guy who asked it. So people aren't happy with the way she was, you know, caught not thinking on her feet quickly with that whole situation. Right. Well, let's be real about this, right? Uh, yeah. Republicans of color, and there are not very many of them, uh, yeah. are, are upset about it. Um, a. B, if it was a plant, as a lot of people say it was, or a gotcha question, it would have been a plant uh, by the Haley campaign. It's such a softball that I would want somebody to ask me that question so I had the opportunity to answer it correctly. Uh, so it's not a gotcha question, it's a, it's a gift. Uh, and and she really dropped and broke the gift um, if it was in fact a plant. The other side of it is, you know, she's running in a Republican primary. This will hurt her. Democrats should hope that she is the nominee because this will hurt her terribly should she be the nominee. Uh, I don't know how much it hurts her in a Republican uh, yeah. in a Republican primary season in 2023, 2024. I mean, it just to me uh, the tone of that of that 
party right now, as dictated by Trump, says that this is not such a big um, faux pas uh, for a candidate to make, as distasteful yeah. as that is and how I wish I didn't believe it. I just I, I do think that there is, you know, the, the, it's a big fire that's not going to really spread unless she's the nominee. I may be wrong and it may be a reason that she just gets so much criticism that she becomes um, yesterday's flavor in this campaign. Well, she was asked a question yesterday, uh, and let's see if we have video of this one, Albert. This is, uh, she's, as, and I don't know how it's to redeem yourself, but the person says, I'll let you redeem yourself after yesterday's faux pas. And I want to ask you if you would ever consider becoming Trump's vice president. And what's interesting to me is she doesn't actually say no. Right. She kind of skirts around it. You never run for second, blah, blah, blah. The typical answer. But she doesn't say I would not serve under Trump. Let's, let's watch the video. Is it a chance to redeem yourself after last night's slavery thing? Um, would you be able to say categorically that you will not accept being Trump's vice president? I could say to you what you want to hear and you could go check that box and go do whatever but I'm gonna to continue to tell you my truth and the truth that I have always told the truth, even when I was in the administration. President Trump and I worked well together. Why? Because I told him the truth. Now, if you wanna talk about vice president, I will tell you this now, I've said it before. I don't play for second. I've never played for second. I'm not gonna start now. Uh -huh. But she didn't say no. She didn't say no and she said she worked well with Trump. What does that mean? Is this another case of her trying to appeal to that Trump base? Of course, it's smart. You know, I mean, well, well, don't go out. You see the people that are making anti-Trump uh, within this primary that she's in right now. And I'm not talking about the primary that would happen if Trump wasn't there, because other people would certainly run. Within this primary, there are people who are bashing Trump. Uh, regularly, when you look at Chris Christie, there are people that are trying to s embrace Trump, by, but still criticize him. I look at DeSantis there, and there are you know people who embrace him completely, like Ramaswamy. She is trying to play all sides here, which is not you know it might be disingenuous, but it's also not it's not stupid politics. And I think that it's important that she not distance herself completely for Donald Trump because that. Acreage is already taken up, and it's not a, it's not a big plot of land in the Republican Party. Mm. Um, and meanwhile, she keeps rising in the polls. Do you think that her, what's happened to her this week kind of stalls her progress there? I would imagine so. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I talked before about how it doesn't really matter in a Republican primary. I don't think the words matter as much as the perception of a flawed candidate matters. And so I think that's it's almost certainly will hurt her. I don't know that there's been a poll taken since this has happened. Her rise in the polls was in New Hampshire, uh, and you know, New Hampshire is, has a bit of an independent streak. Uh, always has. Uh, they don't always nominate or or, uh, or vote for and support in their primary. The Person who goes on to be president, nor does Iowa, but but I, I just think that this is the type of place where a Republican who isn't Donald Trump could do well. So it's not surprising to see one of them within striking range, actually within the margin of error in New Hampshire. I think right. the polls are going to be a little different after this week. For mm. Let's move on to President Biden. I was reading a story about his whole Bidenomics thing falling flat. And the reason why people are not really buying it, and it might be because we're still seeing high prices at stores. Uh, he's trying to sell that um, his role in the post-pandemic economic recovery has been a good thing, but I, Americans apparently are not really going with it. Yeah, I, look, I, I think a lot of it is messaging, right? I mean, Democrats get crit criticized. This administration particularly gets criticized for their is issues with messaging. I think um, you look at Obamacare, that was well messaged. Uh, mm -hmm. You look at Reaganomics, that was well messaged. Uh, I think Bidenomics was hard to convince people of coming out of the pandemic uh, when there was so much uncertainty. Are we going back to work? Are we going to an office? Uh, why is gas so expensive? When 
mm-hmm. is the supply chain going to correct itself? And when it does, why are the prices still so high? You know, these are the ki- types of things that hit people at home. You know, the, the, if a loaf of bread went down with the same sort of velocity as the price of gas does when it goes down, uh, then I think people would be looking at it in a different way. But that's not mm-hmm. the way it works. And also people are saying, look, you know, if you own a restaurant and yesterday people were spending sixty dollars on a on a steak um that that you wish you could sell for 50 but hey people are selling it for or buying it for 60 well i'm going to keep selling it for 60. Uh, so a lot of the things that are tangible um downturns in prices uh which is what economics is about to the to the consumer and to the you know the man and woman on the street then then yeah it's very difficult to have that happen but messaging is going to change i've talked about a lot in this space that you know the democrats are going to spend a lot of money they're sitting on over a billion dollars they're going to spend a lot of money telling you why bidenomics has helped and that will make a difference well they need to because the poll numbers for president biden are not looking pretty good uh his approval Approval rating has fallen to a record low of 34%. This according to a Monmouth University poll released last week. Nearly 70% of people who answered this poll disapproved of his handling of inflation. More than half of respondents disapproved of Biden's records on jobs, even though he's presiding over a historically strong labor market. And that kind of goes to what you're saying about messaging and getting the word out that actually what you think is happening is the opposite. Right. Yeah, I, I think, um, you, you know, you can't pick and choose which polls you want to listen to. Um, right. So and Monmouth is a good polling place, but you can look at the dynamics and know that those are going to change. And the dynamics right now are that you have uh, a number of Democrats who are taking polls who don't want Joe Biden to be their nominee, who like Joe Biden, thinks he's done a good enough job, but would mm-hmm. love to see him replaced on the ticket, uh, not because they dislike him or don't think he's done well, but because they think that he's too old. And so mm-hmm. there is, there's a little bit of, uh, I think, polling self-sabotage that's going on. You have Republicans who are not gonna like uh, what the president's doing anyway. And then there is feeble support. I mean, this is not a, you know, when you look at 34%, I, I bet that the, many of the 34% who are giving him favorable reviews are giving it with a, yeah, yeah, I think he's done a good job, but, right? I mean, so mm-hmm. there, there is not this sort of gush that's happening. I think that will change when he is the nominee. It won't, might not get him to 58%, but I think it will, it will certainly improve his numbers because then everybody or everyone who will get on board will be on board. And you're going to see, I think, a more vocal um, support for what he's done and uh, combined with a you know, a refutation of what the other side is doing. Speaking of Biden, another uh, article from Politico that I was reading last night was talking about a shift in policy in Ukraine. And apparently by the Biden administration and European officials are quietly shifting their focus now from supporting Ukraine's goal of total victory over Russia to now improving its position in an eventual negotiation to end the war. So I don't know what this means. Does that mean that Ukraine could give up some territory or that Russia could actually come out on top in this one? I don't see it as Russia coming out on top. I think the most important thing, and I I think the tease for this kind of a posture from these nations and from the United States, and there are a couple of them. One is the money, you know, the, the, the push for that money in not just in the United States, but most most uh, certainly the biggest numbers from the United States, but in other Western European countries, the passion has gone away for the blind support uh, when when the end game isn't as uh, as clear. The other part of it was uh, NATO saying that they're now having conversations about bringing, uh, you know, they've taken up the issue of Ukraine becoming a member state. And I think at that point, then you have to have Ukraine listen to you a little bit rather than you listening to Ukraine. And um, so I, I don't, you know, I don't know what the uh, what the the horse trading is going to be like uh, for yeah. land. I know that this has been not good for Russia, not good for Putin. I, I, I feel like Putin, um, from what I've been reading and, and from, you know, I read the counteroffensive coming with Tim Max. Um, uh, piece, uh, uh, his his writing, former uh, NPR guy coming out of Ukraine. It, there seems to be this idea that so, this thing has to end, that it doesn't have this sort of 
lifelong um, uh, conflict field that others have. You know, when we look at Israel and the Palestinians, for example, it, which seems like that's been our whole lives and, it, you know, it's never going to be resolved completely. This mm -hmm. seems like there's a resolution. I think it was spurred on by NATO and I think it was spurred on by a reluctant Congress uh, in the United States um, in terms of giving more aid to Ukraine. Let's move to domestic politics when uh, we'll go to New York City, where the New York mayor is now putting these new rules in place, trying to affect what Texas is doing when it comes to busing in migrants. So Mayor Eric Adams issuing an executive order on Wednesday to restrict the flow of migrant charter buses sent by Texas Governor Greg Abbott to New York City. <clears throat> he says, no, if you're going to bus migrants here, you can only do it between 8.30 a.m., on uh, and noon on weekdays, and you have to give us uh, 32 hours warning that the buses are going to come. Uh, and the Texas mayor's like, or uh, governor's like, yeah, no. Abbott says, I'm that's I don't play by your rules. Uh, can the New York mayor do that, or do the buses just stop and park and people get off no matter what the rules are? Well, I mean, the New York mayor can't sort of, you know, by uh, just a legal fiat say this is yeah. what we're doing, um, right. but. Uh, it's you know these are all politicians, uh, and yeah. and Eric Adams is is a politician. He's saying, look, we're not saying no, but we're saying we need to figure out how to deal with this in a in an organized way. So you're playing right. both sides of the fence. And Greg Abbott says, you know, he doesn't play by anybody's rules. He plays right. by his own rules, and uh, and those rules are being challenged now in the court. So uh, uh, th this is this is a you know you talked about it at the top of this segment, mm -hmm. Kim. Uh, 2024, get used to it. Well, speaking of Abbott playing by nobody's rules, the Department of Justice is now threatening a lawsuit over this Texas border law, which makes the illegal border crossing a state crime and allows state judges to deport migrants. Well, this is federal jurisdiction, and Texas can't do that, but they just did. So now the Department of Justice is saying, yeah, no, we're going to fight you on this one. This is kind of ballsy. I mean... I guess par for the course with with Abbott. Yeah, I mean, I think what Al Abbott's doing is is ballsier in in a way because <laughs> yeah. it's it's so extra legal. But I I think that that this is the proper response from and and the expected response. It's what Abbott mm -hmm. probably knew was going to happen. He certainly knew what was going to happen uh, right. when he when he did this. Uh, so the Justice Department stepping in, and I think the the issue is going to be well, there there are Democratic governors in other border states, uh, in southern border states like California, and in in Arizona. So I, I and New Mexico as well. So I, I think you're going to find that that posture is not going to be as successful, but Texas does things in its very own way. No, they do. But I don't know how you get around that this is federal jurisdiction. You can't, I mean, it's an international border crossing. Right. This you, is not, you don't. The answer yeah. is you don't, but yeah. Abbott doesn't listen to that. And Abbott likes the fight and him yeah. winning a fight is that's the currency of his power there. And so uh, I mean, it's, isn't he already fighting the, you know, the floating border in the Rio Grande that has the barbed wire wrapped around it? I mean, look yeah. at his record, right? I mean, yeah. this is it's a it's a pretty shady record when it comes to immigration, but it's all based on politics. He's the guy that puts people on a bus. He's the guys with those flotillas. He's the guys with the with he's the guy who's who's trying to, uh, to defederalize the border. It's it's mm -hmm. just not how America works. The border probably a big issue in the 2024 election because President Biden is getting a lot of criticism for the way he's handled things at the border. Do you see anything changing uh, as we run up to the election with what's happening at our border? I mean, I without a sort of a more I see things changing because I see Democrats in Congress saying mm -hmm. that they need that they know things need to change. And yeah. When you start hearing the Senate majority talk about that uh, Senate that may not have the majority, but going into this election year for them, uh, being tough on the border is important. You know, these caravans only happen uh, in even numbered years. Right. So yeah. uh, they are. It is certainly a political vessel and it's a wedge issue. It always has been. Uh, it's never as bad as it seems at the border as the way people portray it. But it's certainly not. Um, it's there are certainly problems there. And those problems are magnified in the election years. But this is, as we've heard people say, this is an opportunity. And yeah. I think our our old friend, Jim, what was his name? Avila? 
uh, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, he used to say that, that it's important for Democrats to have a border policy, which yeah. they don't. But I think coming out of um, the recess, they're going to put together something that's going to put a Democratic uh, f fingerprint on, on, um, on immigration reform. Someone in the chat uh, just mentioned that the plan for Texas to secede from the United States. Have, did you, have you read about that wacky the story? The Republic of Texas, yeah. yes. So, <laughs> I've covered it. I've read about it. I, I uh, mean, really? Yeah. As if they're not on their own out in the wilds already. Now they want to secede. I, right. I mean, it's yeah, as crazy as the, what is it, the Republic of Jefferson in California? I don't yeah. see it going anywhere, but it's just like, really? Come on. No, I don't see it going there, but there's certainly more of a it's it's got a, a wider reach in Texas than it does in California. Yeah. So Michael uh, Shore, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for everything that you have contributed to and done for the Mark Thompson show in 2023. And I hope that we get a lot more of you in 2024. Uh, you will have as much of me as you as, as I can possibly give. So uh <laughs> and uh, it's been a pleasure. Happy New Year to everyone who uh watches and listens and to all of you. Uh, even to Mark. Even, even, even say to him, yes. Yeah. Michael Shore, thank you so much. We'll see you next year. Bye. Bye, bye Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell, you'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.